I need a haircut. Like, bad. I'm getting it done this Friday, so uh, say goodbye, unfortunately, to these luxurious locks. Not so much locks, but bangs. I got I got bangs for days. Okay, today's video, as I'm sure you already noticed, uh, if you couldn't tell, is Geography is Everything! Geography is Everything! Geography is Everything! Yes, on, that's right, Whiskey Peak, the first island the Straw Hats ever went to on their Grand Line journey in the first half of the Grand Line in Paradise, which of course means I had to go out and buy some Fireball whiskey for the purposes of this video, which um, I'm not really sure if it really is whiskey all that much. I was I commented on this on Twitter, I was just like, hey, I'm just buying some whiskey to go talk about a fictional island in a story about pirates with superpowers, as you do, and some people were like, ah, I don't know if that's considered whiskey, but whatever, it has whiskey on the bottle, close enough, right? And Barry is actually gonna be the new spokesperson for Fireball Whiskey. It'll toughen you up like a brick, okay? So, um, yeah, yeah, this is gonna be Whiskey Peak. I typically try to connect these Geography is Everything videos back to something going on, like in the present storyline of One Piece and the manga or the anime, or, or some kind of connection. Uh, in this case, I don't really have anything. I just wanted to talk about Whiskey Peak for a while, because it's one of the two islands I have yet to discuss on Geography is Everything that the Straw Hats have actually been to. Uh, Whiskey Peak and Long Ring Long Land, which is the next one. I think after Long Ring Long Land, I think I've covered every single island the Straw Hats have been through. Um... I've, like I said, East Blue is a little weird because the geography of a lot of those islands is not really crazy, and I already did a East Blue video where I covered everything. Did a video on Logtown, but yeah, I think Whiskey Peak and Long Ring Longland, that'll be it. So, uh, let's dive right into it. Go to that intro! Alright, so Whiskey Peak located on Cactus Island. That's right, most people just think the island is named Whiskey Peak, but no, it is actually Cactus Island. And I tried to get a cactus for the purposes of this video, but uh, that was a little bit more harder than the whiskey. Hey man, you try finding a cacti last minute on a Wednesday in the middle of Appalachia, in the middle of Western PA. A little bit easier said than done. Has anybody actually ever uh, been um, like uh, pricked with a cacti before? Like either fallen into a cactus or touched it like me because you're an idiot? Yeah, that happened to me once. I was like five years old. I was at my grandparents house They had this little little cacti and uh, I, my, my dad was talking to my uh, grandparents And I figured it was like a fake cactus like something you would buy at the dollar store Like it's like a squishy cactus or whatever So I'm like ooh, and I touched it and oh my god It's it's it, your hand goes numb immediately even after you pull out the sp the spines It still really hurts and it's like numb for a while. So yeah, I uh, don't recommend don't recommend only a three out of ten for me Maybe a four. All right so, um, the Straw Hats arrive in the Grand Line at around chapter 100 in the story, and keep in mind, this point in the story, the Grand Line was built up as the Pirate Graveyard! That's where ships go to die! You know, the people go into that part of the, that part of the world and they don't come back out. Except for Krieg and his ship, but he barely made it out. And also Mihawk and his coffin ship, but Mihawk is the person that kind of causes the damage to Krieg's ship, so we saw that. Also, it's surrounded by the Calm Belt, which has the giant sea monsters, the sea kings everywhere, so most people in the East Blue and all the other blues were kind of fearful of the Grand Line, like, stay away from it. Yeah, after we spent a couple hundred chapters in the Grand Line, it kind of mellowed out a little bit, at least for us, the fans. You know, the Straw Hats are sailing from one island to another giant monster comes out to attack the Sunny or the Mary, and it's just like, eh, whatever. That's par for the course, right? That's that's why by the time we got to Saba Odi, Oda had to start building up the new world even more so. It's like, oh well, you thought you thought the first half of the Grand Line was the pirate graveyard. <laughs> Get ready for the new world because that'll make um, the first half look like a paradise, and hence why the first half of the Grand Line is referred to as paradise. But you don't really you don't really find that out until the halfway point of the story because it would be kind of lackluster if the Straw Hats were like sailing down Reverse Mountain and there was like a giant banner that just said, like, Welcome to Paradise! Like, Laboon, like, uh, Crocus takes some paint and just paints on Laboon's body. Welcome to Paradise, adventurers! Um, so they land at Reverse Mountain, they meet Crocus. Crocus kind of gives them a brief tutorial on the Grand Line. Here's a log pose, you're gonna need this to navigate if you just don't want to die immediately. And he also explains to them there's seven levels of, uh, magnetism. There's seven islands kind of right after Reverse Mountain that you can kind of lock onto, and you can kind of go from island to island using the log pose. You can even, like, you know, deviate off the course, go to another island, and lock onto that magnetic chain. You could do whatever. And so, the 
Straw Hats, though, I don't think they arrive at Whiskey Peak by accident, or they just pick it out of a hat, like, let's go down this, this lane instead of that one. Because they also meet Mr. Nine and Miss Wednesday. Hey, I'm making this video on a Wednesday. Miss Wednesday, there's the connection! There's the connection! It's tenuous, but it's all I got. Um, you got Miss Wednesday, who is actually Vivi, the Princess of Alabasta. They, uh, meet the Straw Hats at Reverse Mountain, and they try to kill Laboon and use his, um, you know, his meat to feed the townsfolk. So I think that's the reason they head back to Whiskey Peak, you know, because they're, like, traveling with them on the Mary, and then they get to Whiskey Peak, and then Mr. Nine and Miss Wednesday, they leave the ship, and the Straw Hats arrive on the island, and they are welcome with a, a, a raucous display from the townsfolk. Everybody comes out. Men, women, children, old people. You got dogs in the streets that are like, woo, yes, welcome pirates. Everybody's happy, right? So, and it's, it's really foreboding at first. Like, the Straw Hats are approaching the island, and it's really foggy and really misty, which um, also makes sense given that in the four kids dub, obviously, you couldn't call it Whiskey Peak. I mean, an allusion to alcohol? No way, man. Standards and practices, they'll, they'll shut that down immediately. But you know what? Honestly, the, the way they changed it around, not too bad. They changed it from Whiskey Peak to Misty Peak, which, you know, when the Straw Hats first arrived there, it was a rather misty town, so I guess that makes sense, right? It's all good at the end of the day. Um, and so the Straw Hats arrived there, and they're like, oh, man. First island in the Grand Line, guys. What are we going to encounter through this mist? Giant monsters, pirates, you know, ridiculously powerful devil fruit users. What's going to be through the fog? And they get to the other end of the fog, and it's the whole town on the side of the river. The island is basically split right down the middle, middle with a river, you know, flowing right in between it. So you could just sail into the island, dock your ship, and then just, you know, head on straight on to the next island after that, right? So pretty convenient in that respect. Um, because the island is called Cac... The globe is fine. I thought it was very precariously perched up there, and I was I was right, but it's it's okay. The globe is okay. It's gonna push it over here. Okay, okay, cool. Anyway, the reason it's called Cactus Island is because the giant mountains that exist on the island look remarkably like cacti. Get back to those in a second, because we actually find out a little bit of a dark twist regarding those mountains, okay? Um, but anyway, the mayor of the town is a nice fellow by the name of Igarapoy, and Igarapoy is this guy that kind of resembles, I, I don't know, to me, he always resembled, like, a, uh, a guy from, like, the colonial age, you know, because just the way he dresses, and he looks like he's wearing, like, a powdered wig, and they're shaped like eights, because it turns out Igarapoy is actually Mr. Eight, who is actually Igaram! He, wants, he goes through like three different names throughout the, the course of an arc. We find out he's Igarapoy, and then Mr. Eight, and then Igaram is his, is his true name there. But he is, um, he set himself up as the mayor of Whiskey Peak, and he, uh, he expresses that, like, we, we, all, we welcome pirates to this island. When pirates arrive, we throw them a big epic party. And anytime they ask questions, like, you know, because there's a few questions regarding that. Like, wait a second, why would you throw parties for pirates? <laughs> like, these are, pi you know, most pirates are not like the Straw Hats that just arrive and just want to have a good time and a fun adventure. You figure a lot of other pirates are going to arrive on this island and, like, you know, want to steal things or plunder. That's typically what pirates do. But no, the, the Whiskey Peak inhabitants are just like, nah, don't worry about it. We just party here. Okay, but what what purpose would you have for giving up all of your food and liquor to a bunch of random str- Ah, stop it! Pirates, fun, party! You know, so... <laughs> The Straw Hats kind of fall for it, sort of. Now, Zoro doesn't, and Nami doesn't. Luffy, Sanji, and Usopp, they, they all fall for it, though. Of course they do, right? And so, any questions regarding, like, Nami asks Igarapoy, I was like, what, what about the log pose? When does that reset? And Igar Igaram, Igar Igarapoy is like, uh, the log pose? What? I, I'll, I'll stop talking about such nonsense. Come in here and drink this booze. Drink this booze until you pass out. Because of fun, <laughs> you know? That's essentially how they do it. Um, they got a bunch of beautiful ladies there, which that's all that freaking Sanji needs. And they have a bunch of amazing food and all the chefs come out like, We got meat, man! We got meat, man! It's like Luffy that's like, all right, that's all Luffy needs, right? So Luffy and Sanji are immediately swayed into the, uh, the, the, um, the alluring nature of this town, all right? So, um, it's kind of like Vegas in that respect, right? Um... God, you know, I've been I've been reading uh, I've been reading another D and D uh, campaign, you know, for you know maybe if I want to DM someday, and I'm just like, man, this would be so many red flags. It's just like your party arrives in a town, and they're immediately happy to see you and throw a massive party in your honor, despite the fact they have never met you before. <laughs> like that's gonna end swimmingly, right? Okay. 
Um, so obviously this town is a front. The whole happy nature welcoming pirates and getting them drunk and, you know, uh, gorging them senseless until they pass out. Yeah, that's all a front for the evil criminal organization known as Baroque Works! Dun 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 dun! Everybody knew that. Like, who the hell is watching this video and doesn't know about Whiskey Peak? You know, really? Okay. Um, so Baroque Works, the organization, of course, headed up by Crocodile or Mr. Zero. Um, we first get introduced to it here at Whiskey Peak. Uh, Zoro is already kind of familiar with this organization, and he kind of reveals this later on. That uh, a member of the organization, Mr. Seven, once tried to recruit Zoro into becoming an agent. Because Zoro, before he joined the Straw Hats, he before he was the pirate hunter, he was a pirate hunter. He was a bounty hunter, right? So, uh, Mr. Seven tried to recruit him a couple years back. Zoro just sliced him down. He just he just killed him. That's one of the first like, examples of Zoro just being revealed. Like, oh yeah, he just straight up killed somebody. Like, that's not like... He didn't knock him out with the back of the sword. It was like, no, Zoro straight up killed Mr. Seven. Um, it just happened off screen, right? And so, um, we find out a little bit about, you know, Zoro... Zoro's passed with them there. Uh, we find out the basics of the organization in terms of like their numbering structures and stuff. There's officer agents, there's frontier agents. Um, I guess we found out about them a little bit before this at Reverse Mountain, but we didn't really find out the whole organization, like what they are, until we got to Whiskey Peak. So in the case with Mr. Nine, he is weaker than Mr. Eight, so he, they're, they're frontier agents. They're a little bit lower down the totem pole. And then anybody that's uh, number five and higher is an officer agent and has devil fruit powers and is a lot stronger. Every Every agent has kind of like a partner to help them out with, you know, stuff like that. So Mr. Nine has Miss Wednesday, Mr. Eight has Miss Monday, um, who is, uh, she takes the appearance of like a nun in the village, okay? And so everyone has kind of this like a uh, disguise that they put up. Every uh, random um, citizen in Whiskey Peak, from the chefs to the fishermen to the guy that runs the bakery uh, to the clergy, everybody in the island is a bounty hunter. Everybody. Which makes me start to question like... Was this town originally built as a regular town and Baroque Works just took it over at one point? Like there were regular citizens just living on this island and trying to make a living. And then Baroque Works came in and just, you know, either recruited them. It's like, hey, you're either going to become a bounty hunter and work for us or we're just going to kick you off the island. Or was this an island that was built specifically for the purposes of being a Baroque Works outpost? Which that makes a lot of sense why they would do that because you would figure a lot of the islands that are the closest to Reverse Mountain, you would probably probably not want to live on those islands because those are the islands that are the most likely to be hit by pirate attacks, okay? People come down, pirates come down Reverse Mountain, they get into the Grand Line, they pick one out of seven random islands to travel to, and uh, yeah, the weather is pretty intense. Like, just traveling from Reverse Mountain to Whiskey Peak, the weather was pretty intense, you know, more so than, like, in the blues, right? Um, but they really hadn't, most pirates had not dealt with the, the true dangers of the Grand Line yet. If the pirates are going to give up and try to escape through the Calm Belt, you'd think that would be like they traveled to, like, maybe to, like, one or two islands, not just the first one and then gave up. I'm sure plenty of them did that too. My point is, though, if you're just a regular civilian, if you're just a farmer and you're living in a tiny village, you would probably not want to be on one of those islands, right? You'd want to be a little bit further into the Grand Line. So, maybe Cactus Island was completely desolate, like, a, you know, a, an uncharted island. Not uncharted, but, like, unmanned. So, maybe Whiskey Peak and Cactus... So maybe Cactus Island was like that. It was an island that was uh, uninhabited for a long time. And then when Mr. Zero started up Baroque Works, he's looking at all the islands at the start of the Grand Line because that's like the beginning stages of Paradise. That's kind of where Baroque Works had its all of its activity at, right? Uh, you know, Crocodile kind of just like took care of like the weaker part of the weaker half of the Grand Line. And, um... And so they were like, okay, let's set up an outpost on this island, Cactus Island. Let's build a town. Let's call the town Whiskey Peak. And let's make it set up like, oh, we're a welcoming town to pirates. And pirates show up. Not just pirates. I'm sure if it was regular civilians or bounty hunters, pretty much they're in the opportunity of just like stealing from anybody that shows up. Even probably other bounty hunters. You know what I mean? And so that's all the citizens there. Even the children. Even the children are set up to be like, you know, oh, please, mister, don't hurt me. I'm just a child. And then you, they, they take out like some sleeping gas or something and just 
<gasps> stupid brat, and then you pass out, and then they steal all your money. So that's essentially the point of it there. Also, it helps that whenever a pirate like Luffy, with a pretty high bounty, I mean, 30 million at this point, but pretty good considering the East Blue and all that stuff, he's the most wanted man in the East, pirate comes down with a lot of bounty, you could always just, you know, hey, have some food, have some booze, and then, you know, they pass out, and then, you know, you take them, and you throw them over, and you give them to the Marines. Because I guess as long as the Marines do not know that you're a member of Baroque Works, if you're just a regular bounty hunter, you would get the bounty for it, right? I, I guess that's how that would work. Pirates can't turn in other pirates, uh, and Baroque Works is probably this criminal organization. The Marines probably wouldn't trust them either, but if you're just like, oh yeah, I'm a random bounty hunter from this island. Here is Straw Hat Luffy. Thank you for the 30 million, and then go away and then give the money and share it with the town and stuff. Um, that's also why Mr. Nine and Miss Wednesday were trying to kill Laboon to bring back all the whale meat, because they're kind of low on provisions. Um, Miss, Miss Monday even says this, after the Straw Hats, after Luffy and Usopp and Sanji are all conked out, and they also think Zoro and Nami are also, you know, unconscious as well, Miss Monday's like, damn, why did we have to throw this huge party for them every single time? You know how much food we wasted? You know how much booze we wasted there? You know, and you guys didn't bring back any of that whale meat, so what are we gonna eat this month? That rubber kid in there ate like 15 freaking full course meals, you know? So, that's a situation there. You'd figure like, yeah, that'd be another one. They'd be like, why would you give us all your food in, an, in, in an, uh, a sea that is really treacherous to probably fish in? Why would you just give us food? So there's no way you would probably, like, unless you're like Luffy that just like meat or Sanji that's like girls, uh, you would probably distrust these people immediately, which is what Nami and uh, Zoro did. So even though Nami and Zoro drank enough to like probably kill most people, um, they still managed to be okay. I mean, I guess Zoro just sliced right through his hangover and Nami apparently has a huge tolerance for that um, because they drink till they're under the table and then later on in the arc, they're just perfectly fine. Zoro walks outside while Igaram, Mr. Eight, is giving his big, you know, speech or everything like, we're gonna capture the, you know, Straw Hat Luffy for 30 million and we're gonna report him to the boss and everything like that and Zoro's up there on top of one of the houses in the moonlight it's one of the au most awesome scenes because you get Zoro's theme in the background you know and then you also have the moon there and he's in silhouette and he has his swords out and he's just like I heard everything you guys said I know exactly who you guys are you are Baroque works and he stands up on that roof and he kind of looks down and he's like yeah I bet there's about a hundred of you guys give or take and I'm gonna slice all of you down. Oh, yeah. And then Igaram is like, Ah, oh, I see. Well, it looks like just another gravestone is going to be added to the Cactus Rocks tonight. And then that's when we zoom in to the mountains outside of the town. Slowly but surely, you realize that they're uh, not like naturally occurring spines. Like, they're not real cacti. They're just mountains. They're rocks. But in the rock and in the dirt on the mountaintops you have just a bunch of identical tombstones, which from a distance give the impression that they're cacti with like little spines sticking out. And each tombstone is apparently someone that came to the island and was killed by Baroque Works, the bounty hunters that resided there. These mountains are big. These are huge. They are mountains. To be considered mountains, pretty big, right? Huge mountains. And you can see them to scale with the town and everything like that. By the way, Whiskey Peak seems to be the only town on the island. Um, there's hundreds, thousands, maybe even tens of thousands or more tombstones on these damn mountains. So that says a few things right away. So number one, that says this whole Baroque Works operation, Whiskey Peak, that has to have gone on for... I want to say decades to get that high of a freaking body count, but it couldn't have been for that long because Crocodile, you know, he's only in his early 40s, you know, and he didn't he didn't have Baroque works when he was like in his uh, mid 20s because we know when Crocodile was in his mid 20s, he fought against uh, Whitebeard and he got defeated by him, kind of got crushed. Uh, Crocodile had his ambitions to become King of the Pirates. Whitebeard shut that down pretty quickly, though. Also, probably the thing that resulted in Crocodile losing his hand was probably the fight with Whitebeard. Not confirmed, but I think most people could probably say that. I guess it might have also been something relating to Ivankov, you know, relating to his uh, secret. But at any rate, when Crocodile was in his mid-twenties, uh, he did not, he wasn't the master of Baroque works at that point, which means that I would say Baroque Works probably came into existence 
sometime within maybe the last 15 years at most something around there so it like even if like 15 even okay even if you say 20 years right like let's just say 20 years i don't think it's been around for that long but let's just say 20 years 20 years to get this many damn bodies buried up on that mountain you think they wouldn't even bother burying them right or even if they're not buried up there, maybe they just get rid of their bodies and throw them in the ocean afterwards. You know, they would go through the trouble of making tombstones for every single person and like putting it up on the mountain. Like it's a really cool aesthetic and it has a lot of dread. And in the scene in the anime with the theme in the background, there's this really creepy, it's, it's Zoro's theme, right? And it's this really creepy like saxophone that's playing in the background as it zooms in slowly on the mountain. And by the way, the names on the tombstones are actually relevant. They're the names of like the anime department uh, reversed. So I think there's like an one of the anime director's names is there like reversed. So yeah, stuff like that. I also thought that they put Oda's name on one of the tombstones but I looked and I didn't see that I remember reading that somewhere that Oda's name was on one of the tombstones but I looked through the episode I even went back in the manga and checked the manga there's only one tombstone that has a name of it uh, in the manga and it's uh, by the name of Mr. Sacrifice uh, written in English of course you know Oda writes the tombstone in English for you know the Japanese audience so maybe they didn't know right away what it was but you know you read it in English and it's like Mr. Sacrifice well I mean he fulfilled his destiny, didn't he? he? did not. I mean, I guess his name was Sacrifice. All right, and they were very polite. They also put misters and misses on the tombstones. So they're a bounty hunter crew on this outpost, but they're very polite. They learn your name and they give you the proper honorific when they put you up on the tombstone. They carve the tombstone. You know, they have to have someone in town to carve hundreds and hundreds of tombstones to put them up on the mountain. Uh, it just, it doesn't make a lot of practical sense to me, but it looks cool, and I guess that's all that matters, right? Or hey, hey, who knows? Maybe even long before Baroque Works even came to the island, maybe the people that lived there before that, that was a practice they had. Like, not they were bounty hunters, it's just like, they had a tradition where whenever somebody died on their island, they would bury them on the cactus rocks. That was just a thing. And then Baroque Works came to the island and took it over, and maybe they were like, yeah, let's just continue that trend. Why not, right? Okay. So yeah, that's the cemetery. Uh, Sapotan Graveyard is the actual name of it. But let's talk about the town right now, okay? So even when I first watched the episode when I was like a kid watching the 4Kids dub, I realized the town itself looked very similar to like a, um, a southwestern United States kind of town, you know, like in New Mexico or Arizona, just with the houses. The houses look like they're made out of like clay or mud, and they have like the cross beams that are sticking out, and they have the ladders everywhere. I remember, uh, you know, uh, just reading about that kind of stuff or maybe seeing a movie, but it might have been like an El Dorado, like a movie I watched growing up or uh you know they have the houses with the ladders and stuff so those are actually i looked into it those are uh pueblo houses and they were used by the native americans they built those kind of houses like a bunch of different tribes made these kind of styles of houses and the idea was you make several layers several uh floors of these homes that you could only access via ladders so if someone's like attacking your town you could take in the ladders and you know you know drag them into the home so they can't reach the second or third floor so there's no actual stairs like inside the houses themselves you'd have to go outside go up the the ladder and move the ladder you can't get up sleek walls made out of like mud and you know the rafters with logs of wood and everything like that really cool design and aesthetic and it also reminds me of monsters um the one shot that oda drew because that kind of takes place in like a western kind of town and this is like a southwestern new mexico kind of setting there so i really like the design of the town as well as the the cactus rocks in the background and also the moon the moon is freaking huge in this arc for whatever reason the, mu the moon is massive and most of this arc, um, arc takes place at night um um, from when the Straw Hats, like when Zoro, you know, challenges all the bounty hunters, and then Nami shows up, and then you have Mr. Five and Miss Valentine's, and then Nami and Vivi make the arrangement, and then they go to, they leave the island. All that happens in a single night, okay? Now, Zoro fighting Luffy, all that happens at one night. And so the moon is there in the constant backdrop, just looking really huge and really creepy. Honestly, I'd be really afraid. I'd be more concerned about the moon about to crash into the planet than I would be about the bounty hunters at that point. Like, Zoro comes out like, okay, yeah, you guys are all bounty hunters, and that's great. Have you guys seen the damn moon look at that thing it's like 30 times bigger than usual it's gonna crash in we're gonna go majora's mask we need to get out of here now <laughs> no one said the grand line was this dangerous right I love the fight between Zoro and the bounty hunters. Uh, for one thing, we get to see him break out Yubashiri and Sandai Kotetsu for the first time, but Zoro just spanks their asses. He just wipes out everybody. Uh, and in the four kids, because I recently watched it preparing for this. Because it's four kids, 
they have just puns everywhere. So every time Zoro takes out a bunch of bounty hunters, he uses a pun. But Zoro's VA in the 4Kids dub is one of the very good VAs. Like him and Crocodiles probably have like the best VAs in 4Kids. So it's actually not a bad voice. And because Zoro kind of is like, he's sort of arrogant, but he's just very confident because he knows like, I am stronger than all of you combined. And Zoro likes a good challenge. So Zoro, you know, this isn't one of the swords. This is Enma. He didn't have Enma back then. Oh, if he had Enma back then. But, you know, he's on top of the 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 the, the Pueblo house and he's just like, I know I could cut all you guys down before like the sun comes up. So he gets to it and the entire battle, he's like smirking, just like, uh, like that one scene where he like takes the sword and stabs it through Igaram's hair and he's just like hanging out behind him. And he's just like, mm -hmm. you didn't even hear me coming, did you? Oh, 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 no, I did not. Mm, I thought so. Yeah. And so he's like, I have nothing to fear here. There was that moment where Miss Monday had Zoro pinned down and like takes out the brass knuckles and just bam, like cracks one of the houses. But then Zoro just gets up and just grabs her head and just crushes it. And then she passes out and then it's like, oh, crap. Igaram's using, he has like the, the, the guns hidden inside of his hair and he pulls the drawstring and he's just like, oh, Igaram, papa. And he has like a saxophone with like a gun in it as well mr nine uses oh wow this is this is all working out for me i had one of zoro's swords on standby and i baseball bat on standby can i get a duck like karu can i have a duck oddly enough all the times i've talked about kaido being a duck and i do not have a duck plushie or a duck figurine in arm's length in this room that needs to change. But anyway, yeah, so Mr. Nine uses baseball bats, and he goes up against Zoro, and he tries to fight him a little bit, but Zoro kind of knocks him down. He had some tricks. You know, Mr. Nine, he had, like, the chains inside of the bats that he could shoot out and, like, grab you and, like, hole you in, but, you know, Zoro's there, so not a big deal. Even when Mr. Five and Miss Valentine showed up, Luffy and Zoro were fighting at that point because Luffy wakes up, and he's like, Zoro, why are you all, why are you hurting all the people that fed us? And Zoro's like, Luffy, they're bounty hunters. Shut up! They gave us food! And then Luffy and Zoro start fighting in the middle of the streets. Then Mr. Five and Miss Valentine show up. Mr. Five's got this, uh, the bomb bomb fruit. Miss Valentine's got the kilo kilo fruit. And they're like, they're officer agents. Like, we're really badass. We're higher echelon of freaking Baroque works. And then Zoro and Luffy just bam, bam, and just knock them off to the side. And you don't even just see them again for the rest of that arc. They show up in Little Garden, but they just get knocked out, one-shotted by Luffy and Zoro. I love that. So, at the end of Whiskey Peak, Baroque works was really not much of a threat. Except for the very end of it when we got introduced to Robin. That was that was the one moment, because it's like, wow, Mr. Eight, Mr. Nine, Miss Valentine's Day, Miss uh, Wednesday, Miss Monday, and uh, Mr. Five. Yeah, they didn't really do much, did they? They couldn't really fight against Zoro or Luffy worth of anything. But then at the end of the arc, you get introduced to amazing best girl perfection Robin. Although her name's not Robin yet, it's Miss all Sunday, and she talks like a southern bale in the four kids dub, which adds some sexiness onto that, okay, with the hat and everything. And she, um, but yeah, I love that scene with Zoro and the puns in the four kids dub. I honestly tell you, man, they just make it funnier. There's a scene where one of the bounty hunters takes a bazooka to try to like shoot Zoro in the face, and Zoro kind of like dodges it, and he's like, Whoa, close shave! And then Miss Monday picks up a ladder to go hit Zoro with it, and he's like, You know. They talk about drastic steps. And there's another scene where he like he's fighting against a bunch of bounty hunters on a roof and he slices the roof and he kind of walks away and then the roof's about to cave in with all the people falling down and he's like, elevator going down. Ah! <laughs> and it's like, in that one particular instance, I can kind of see it. Even in the actual canon of the manga, I could see I could see Zoro cracking jokes and puns like that. I kind of could, and it's hilarious. All right. Well, anyway, um, yeah, that's that's the island there. Um, and so after the whole events are over with the unluckies, we get introduced to them too. Um, so they get the sketches of all the straw hats, and then they leave. Um, and then Vivi shows up, and she's like, "I'm the princess. You need to help me." And Igaram's like, "I'm her loyal." guard you have to help her and so uh igaram dresses up like vivi as you do perfect 10 out of 10 and then uh sails off to be a distraction his ship gets destroyed gets blown up by miss all sunday the straw hats get in the mary they all book it out of there and then they meet robin and robin also explains to them there is another island there's um nothing at all island so they she, she tries to give them the eternal pose for that for them just to loop around uh you know alabasta but luffy's like screw that this is my journey i go where i want 
and Miss All Sunday is just like, all right, whatever. And we don't really get a, a feel for her Devil Fruit power yet, but it's just kind of like she can knock things out whenever she wants. Like, knock the gun out of Sanji's hand or whatever. I think the only time Sanji ever used a gun... That was such a weird scene, right? Because, like, Zoro takes out his swords, Usopp takes out his slingshot, Nami takes out her staff, Luffy's like, huh? It's like, maybe Oda felt it would be stupid for Sanji just to hold his... Well, for two reasons. Number one, it would be kind of stupid for Sanji just to hold his foot like this up against Robin's head. Like, I'm gonna kick you eventually. But also, Sanji doesn't kick women. So that's why he takes out a gun instead. But in that instance, as soon as he noticed that, you know, it was it was Robin we're talking about here, he immediately drops the gun and like, oh, you're beautiful. I hope that one day you join this crew so that I can obsess over you all the time. Well, there we go. So yeah, that, that all worked out for everybody then, right? Okay. So yeah, um, that was Whiskey Peak. Uh, also had a lot of whiskey. We didn't really specifically pay attention to the whiskey. Maybe there's a special brand of Whiskey Peak whiskey that they just make on the island. Um, so yeah, there's that. Um, hope you guys enjoyed this video. This will be Teching signing out later. Maybe I should take a shot. No, I'm not going to take a shot. Bye, everybody. Barry could take the shots.